I'm talking to you. All right. Um, so reactants for gases. Um, among the products, there was a gas, and then there was a liquid, and we said that because liquid is a less disordered state, therefore the entropy should be lower, and hence there should be a lowering of entropy. This is how we understood the, 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 the negative values of the change in entropy. The question we then left with in the last lecture was, would this process take place spontaneously or not. Okay. So we were talking about some chemical reaction. We did not do the calculation for a chemical reaction. We talked about how uh, when the ice and water are meshed, the entropy Were you present? He, 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 he's asking, he's saying that no, we did not do any chemical reactions. You only said when ice and water are mixed together, then something happens. No, I think, I think you maybe may have opened the wrong page of your notes. Um, so you can ask anybody else. Oh, so his challenge is I should ask anybody else. Yes, sir, I'm not so he's not challenging. Okay, this is not a challenge. But the point is, sorry? He is correct. So because we uh, ended the last lecture on calculating the entropy of water at 483 kelvins. All right. That was... Uh, that was, um, yes, that was one thing that we did. Oh, we didn't do any chemical reaction? Ah, so why was my pointer here? Okay. Okay, so another example then. Good point. Your challenge went very well. Good. Okay, my, I wanted to take another example. Here is uh, using um, entropy calculations in chemical reactions. This is what we are doing at the moment. And uh, we are looking at another example of change in entropy Um, in chemical reactions. And the example that I have from a book um, is about the example is that of uh, um, burning of ethane gas and ethane is C2H6 which is a gas it is combined with burning means hello no more talking please Burning a gas means providing it oxygen, 3.5 moles of oxygen provided again as a gas, giving rise to, as a product of this reaction, carbon dioxide, again a gas, um, 2 moles of it plus 3 moles of H2O, this comes out as a liquid. So burning of ethane gas, uh, mixing ethane with oxygen gives rise to carbon dioxide plus water. And you want to calculate change in entropy for this chemical reaction. And the general relationship for change in entropy that we follow normally is that we will look at the, the entropy of products sum over all um, elements of products, not elements, but components of products, and each one 
appearing in certain mole numbers and subtract from it all the reactants that go into the reaction sum over all reactions and number of moles that go into with each of these reactants so we therefore have uh, I hope this equation is um, clear this will be um, entropy calculated for each of these sum them minus entropy of each of these subtracted okay so entropy of products fun uh, functions product uh, compounds minus entropy of the uh, reactant compounds and as I said in my last lecture entropies are calculated in a particular manner by chemists and put in the form of books and these books are uh, tables of uh, entropy fun entropy values for various functions so you um, quickly go and look up the values of entropy which have been calculated from experimental data so this happens to be equal to now let me write down the whole uh, entropy values this will be three times the entropy of uh, H2O which will be a liquid plus two times entropy of carbon dioxide which will be a gas minus um, entropy of um, C2 H6 which is a gas and uh, we have to specify gas or liquid because when you're looking at tables you will find them um, find the values different in their gaseous phases or liquid phases so we need to uh, put this uh, indicator all the time minus any question? Uh, should we take H2 as a gas because of the temperature of the reaction and temperature? I haven't described any temperature over here. All right. Um, but what is shown is that this comes out as a liquid. Okay. I'm doing this exp uh, this this experiment at at a, at a point where it comes out as a liquid. Maybe a reaction takes place at uh, 70 degrees centigrade or 90 degrees centigrade. All right. Um, minus 3.5 times entropy of O2. This is again the gaseous form. So this equation I have now written explicitly as this equation, and then I will put in numbers that are usually given in that that are take, taken out taken from tables. 69.91. And um, I have myself not looked at tables, but uh, I believe the numbers given in the book were from where I have taken them uh, must be right. Minus 3.5 times uh, 205.138. This is the number. And when you put them all together, you get minus... 310 in units of joules per Kelvin okay joules per Kelvin this is how uh, such a thing is calculated you look into tables you find these things and you put these numbers trivial simple easy and I'm sure chemists um, are pretty happy to have those tables uh, and this is the, this is where actually I started and I said that look change in entropy comes out to be minus this so entropy of uh, product is actually um, uh, less than entropy of reactants or change in entropy um, okay, total total entropy of products Uh, is less than total entropy of reactants and therefore there must be due to um, some odd 
what are taking place and that is when we explain this by saying that look water was formed not steam okay water was formed and water is less disorderly than gas or steam and therefore there has to be a lowering of entropy and that may be what is that is perhaps is what is reflected over here in this negative sign or in this expression and therefore the question afterwards would this play, process take place spontaneously or not? On its own, without being aided by something, would this take place spontaneously or not? If you want to answer this question, we will have to um, look at system plus surrounding and um, uh, need to look at system plus surrounding. And but the area, of course, the surrounding is every, everywhere. But when we say we look at uh, surrounding, we actually mean to say that we actually keep try to see for look for um, uh, heat being uh, exchanged with the surroundings. And if you find that the, huh? Chup se chupate kahan aa gaya? Hain darwaza kisne khola? Acha? All right, you violated the rule, you know, five minutes. How could you enter? You should have yourself refused to come in. Never mind. Heat being exchanged with the surroundings. And uh, therefore, we look at uh, the, the reaction being um, uh, endothermic or exothermic. It takes in heat from the system or gives heat to the system. It turns out to our benefit to our comfort that this is actually an exothermic reaction and um, <clears throat> it gives off heat to the surrounding. I need to, yeah, it, <clears throat> it gives off heat to the surrounding, added to the surrounding and let me, let me quickly, um, before I calculate this uh, exchange of heat to the surround. If we if we know how much heat was exchanged with the surroundings, and then we look at uh, heats of reaction, and as I said a few lectures ago, some lectures ago, that heat of uh, reaction is actually enthalpy, because uh, whatever uh, because reactions take place at normal pressures and temperatures. And when systems accept or reject heat at um, uh, normal temperatures and pressure, that is uh, what goes into changing system enthalpies. So heat of reaction is actually enthalpies. So we will need to actually calculate enthalpies of all these, of this reaction, enthalpy change in this reaction. And for that, we will need to calculate enthalpy or find out enthalpy of each of these compounds uh, which are involved in this uh, interaction, with this reaction. And we will then, to this, all of these enthalpies, we will need to add uh, the heat that is being given out to the environment. Once we do this, and then we take a heat balance of the entire thing, 
then we would know whether the system, the reaction can take place on its own or it will have to be assisted. If, this, if, the, if the reaction is, uh, okay, we will, we, will, we will see this in a minute. Um, note that, let me, let me go back and do a little bit of um, the same old mathematics that I we often do. Enthalpy is taken to be a function of temperature, pressure, and, um, you know, mole numbers of all these species that go into any chemical reaction. Many species go, many compounds are involved in the reaction. And therefore, a change in enthalpy is uh, given by partial differential of H with respect to temperature when P and all the N's, if I put without any index, N which means all the N's, um, times dt plus partial differential of h with respect to p at constant t and n times dp plus and then all the uh, n's so I will put a summation over here um, summation over partial differential of H with respect to Ni, and I am summing over I. I is all this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and suppose there are K components that go into it, then this uh, at constant pressure, at constant temperature, and at constant other ends uh, that are not equal to Ni times D Ni. So this is how we will we look at um, change in enthalpy. The quantity dH by dNi at constant temperature and pressure is uh, called partial <coughs> molar enthalpy. <clears throat> now, if you go back and recall, in a simpler description that we used to have, that we are we have been used to in physics, um, dH was written as uh, uh, T times dS plus V times dP, if you recall, right? We when we calculated H from uh, H, we calculated H from U through a Lijan transformation and in that we only replaced P, interchanged the role of P and V, so we said that H is equal to U plus PV and hence DH was equal to TDS uh, plus VDP. I'm just reminding you of the things that we did um, a few weeks ago. And you must have, have a good practice of these things when you were preparing for your uh, midterm tests. Now from here, you notice that dH by, we are trying to calculate these quantities, uh, this quantity and that quantity dH by dt at constant p. If I want to calculate this quantity, it will be equal to uh, t times dS by dt at constant p and then zero because constant p means this is zero. Okay? From here, I get this expression. And this expression is simply Cp. So this quantity is actually Cp, heat capacity at constant pressure. All right. How about the other quantity, dH by dP at constant uh, uh, dH by 
dp at constant temperature would be equal to um, we can go back to the same expression and again divide by dp and say that it is t times ds by dp uh, dividing by dp plus uh, uh, okay hold on a sec from here one will immediately say that this quantity will be equal to t times ds by dp at constant t uh, plus V times dP by dP, V plus V. Okay? dP by dP will give you 1. So plus V. And this is equal to uh, minus T times dV by dT at constant V because, constant P, because of uh, Max, Maxwell relations. All right? because of Maxwell relations. So we have found a Maxwell equivalent and plus V and this will be equal to, this is this quantity itself is equal to V times alpha P. So minus T V alpha P minus V which is equal to um, V times one minus T alpha P. All right, fine, if this is the, is it uh, correct or is it, yeah? Plus V. Plus V. Plus, sorry, yeah. So this is a uh, minus sign that goes into both. And mm, what happened? Yeah, plus, right? Or ye yahan pe ye minus sign hai. This is correct. This is a minus sign, and therefore this will be one minus. Okay. But this is not taking us very far. We need to have expressions like this to be able to do the calculation correctly. So let me try and uh, uh, propose something else. For dh by dp at constant t. If I were to, okay, there's space over here. If I were to take dH over dP at, um, uh, where am I? Yep. This is something which will be, again, something like this, but slightly, uh, different um, dH by dP at constant t. I could take this to be um, minus dT by dP at constant h dT by dH at constant uh, p. Kya hua? Kya hua? Huh? Johona, who here? Beach, beach, a kyahua. Acha? There was a chablo umpe has a job, has a lake, Koshish Kerman. Okay. Okay. Beach, beach, a yahua. I see. Sure. Okay. Chale. Okay. We now know that um, um, dt by dp at constant h. Isko pehle humne define kiya hua hai as uh, mu h, which we wrote as uh, joule thomson coefficient. You would recall. Joule Thomson coefficient, all right? Or niche ki jo cheese hai ye dt by dh at constant p is uh, uh, t 
dh by dt at constant p inverse and we know that dh by dt at constant p is cp so this is 1 over cp okay and um, therefore this whole thing is equal to uh, minus mu h times cp why did I do all of this? Because now I want to write down this expression in terms of those parameters which can be uh, taken from tables of constants and put in there. All right? So dh equal to, uh, let me first write down the equation. dh, therefore, is, OK, I still have one board over here. dh is equal to cp times dt minus mu h cp times dp plus uh, I did not introduce a notation over here. This notation is, this is three lines defined as, we call it H I bar. Partial molar enthalpy is written as H I bar. So this quantity is plus N I summation over I H I bar N I D N I is the equation now. All right, and we would now start putting in, but all of this effort actually was uh, not terribly needed because ele uh, um, reaction is taking place uh, reaction occurs under constant uh, T and constant P. Therefore, dH actually simply is equal to uh, summation over I, H I bar, D and I. That is it. The total dH is equal to this. And this is what happens. This is equal to, if you now write down this equation for each of these in the reaction, you will again say that this is equal to summation. OK, let me, uh, uh, in the, re in the react among the reactants, among the reactants, yes. I just wanted to go through all of that again and again um, so that you know that there are all these possibilities even among there you know there was this possibility av available but I still chose to uh, take this one so there is a lot of redundancy in what we are doing but we are also in the process uh, learning to deal with these things okay Oh, because, uh, okay, how is temperature constant? Usually, uh, reactions take place under um, um, standard temperature and pressure openly, here on the table. I'm sorry? Yes, heat will be released, but the environment in which temperature is uh, in, the, in this state taking place is uh, the heat is going away into the, to the reservoir to the heat bath, to the environment. And the, even that heat is not increasing the temperature of the environment very much because the heat as a is supposed to be a, is a large, large source of heat. So uh, what is happening is that it takes place um, under standard temperatures and pressure, okay? 
And now, this is written as um, three times molar, um, molar enthalpy of uh, water, which is H2O in liquid form, plus twice molar enthalpy of carbon dioxide, which is gas, minus twice molar enthalpy. There are two of them, right? Two of these and two of those. No, I'm sorry. This is not two. Carbon dioxide was uh, uh, three water and uh, two carbon dioxide and uh, then 3.5 of, sorry. So H of uh, uh, C2H6, which is gas, minus 3.5 H bar of C of, of uh, O2, which is gas. But all of this will have to be equal to the amount of heat given out by the reaction. If you have to look at the total change uh, system plus environment, then we calculate also, include also the amount of heat given out to the environment and which, which we are told is uh, 1,559 kilojoules. Okay? And um, this is the change in enthalpy because of these reactions. This is the heat given out and because it is the heat given out, therefore, there is a minus sign here. And then you look up these numbers and um, you will find that actually, um, uh, so, sorry, so slightly, slightly different. Uh, actually, this is, this is what, this is what um, comes out to be the total when you look at partial molar enthalpy from tables and put them together, this will come out to be the number. Minus 1,559. But the um, change in the surroundings, changing the entropy of the surroundings, this heat is added um, at T equal to, normally 25 degrees centigrade is taken to be the normal temperature, standard temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. And this is often done isothermally without changing any temperature. So delta S surrounding is uh, equal to the heat divided by temperature and this heat is 1559 and temperature is 298 and this happens to be 5232 joule per Kelvin. Oops, I'm sorry. This is times 10 to the power 3. So this is actually when I wrote this uh, expression over here, it is kilo, kilojoule, uh, 10 to the power 3. All right. So what is the lesson we are taking now? We are saying that the total change in entropy is equal to change in entropy of the system plus change in entropy of the surroundings. Am I not clear any? Is, is everything clear? All right. I'm just taking you slowly through what is, how it is done in chemistry, um, as far as I know. Um, 
and this is we had taken we had calculated this to be minus 310 joule per kelvin and this happens to be um, 5,232 5, joules per kelvin and therefore total is um, 4,922 joule per kelvin and the answer is there because now delta S is therefore positive and therefore um, a spontaneous reaction. All right. So we we started off by asking this question: if this uh, reaction, how could we find if the reaction was uh, um, uh, spontaneous? And the way to do this is to calculate the change in enthalpy and compare with the change in enthalpy of the uh, change in entropy. From that, you calculate change in entropy. And then surroundings plus system will give you, tell you whether um, that is um, any uh, positive or negative. Uh, although of the system was negative, of the total system, total system plus uh, surroundings is positive. Oh, the question that he is asking is uh, if the reaction is, uh, can take place spontaneously, then uh, why do you, why doesn't it happen automatically? Why do we have to trigger it? Uh, in many cases, actually, it doesn't even require triggering. Uh, it would, it would, it would take place spontaneously. But then, it usually is uh, in a situation of this kind, which I would, um, I was going to take up as part of my next topic, um, starting now. But I briefly, the answer could be the following that the system can exist in two different situations. One in which um, all the reactants are uh, separate reactants. And the other situation when uh, reaction takes place. And uh, although it can happen, uh, the, 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 the total energy, or either this or I could take it in terms of entropy and show that entropy of this situation is larger than the entropy of this situation, as we have shown already. But I am th 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 thinking of it now in terms of total energy. Um, there may be a little barrier over here. And this barrier will have to be crossed. If there were no barrier, if it were uh, simply something like this, then the separate reactants would automatically on their own react and um, um, reaction will take place. But then something will have to make them cross the barrier so that the reaction takes place. Okay? But once it starts, then it doesn't need any, any more aiding. Yeah. Uh, barrier. Uh, this is in the sense, th this is the energy barrier, so enthalpy barrier. The question was whether this was an entropy barrier or an enthalpy barrier. But this is my guess to the answer of the of your question. I actually do not know why m chemical reactions actually take place. This is a question that you might like to ask your chemistry teachers for a better answer. In my understanding, the, the way I see the whole thing, the things will have to be, you know, if the things can exist in two different uh, situations and phases, then um, uh, if there is no barrier between them, they will automatically go to a state of lower energy. 
And if there's a barrier, then you will need to make it cross the barrier to be able to get there. All right. Okay. So this is uh, how I understand, and I, you might like to um, get a firmer response from answer to this question from your chemistry teachers. All right. Next topic. Uh, this was about uh, the use of uh, thermodynamics in chemistry. There is a large subject called chemical thermodynamics, which includes much, much more than just looking at these things. But I just took out one simple exercise to tell um, how uh, thermodynamic principles are used in uh, a part of chemistry. Uh, just as a way of introduction. So I'm, uh, now I am going back to uh, physics and um, a newer topic of thermodynamics, which is phases and phase transitions. Um, we all know that the fluid systems exist in various phases, solid, liquid, gas. We know that um, uh, magnets exist in various phases, like um, um, ferromagnet, paramagnet, antiferromagnet, etc., etc. And um, we know that um, um, electrical systems exist in phases like insulator conductor, etc. So all of these different states exist. A system can exist in different forms. Um, these are forms in which those substances can exist. Um, solid, liquid, and gas, um, in case of fluids, are uh, usually uh, systems. In these systems are usually uh, these transformations take place at a given uh, temperature and pressure. So there would be a transition at which uh, there will be temperature and there would be a pressure at which such a transition would take place. Uh, let me give you an example without going into as, as a kind of a, a situation that you would be normally come across in the case of phase transitions. So let me draw a, a phase diagram and I don't expect us to be able to completely comprehend it uh, within this lecture or within this course, but we will, we must know um, that this is what um, pressure temperature phase diagram pressure temperature phase diagram and this is uh, the famous phase diagram in which uh, there is this uh, 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 okay coming down like this, lines of separation between various phases. These lines describe various separation, lines of separation. There's gas on this side. There's uh, liquid on this side. And there is uh, solid on this side. So that a system at this particular pressure the line that I have drawn can start at very high temperature as a gas 
at that but this particular temperature can turn can 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 become a liquid and when you further cool down it remains a liquid then at at even lower temperature this much it will it turns into a solid and remains a solid okay so this is what we see as uh, a steam turning into water and water turning into um, uh, ice you can also see a system is starting is too much of talk on this side hello too much of talk on this side why please dusre log disturb ho rahe hain bar bar aapko padh ke dekh rahe hain ye log ha um this also a possibility that you go from here to here you start at a temperature at a constant temperature you increase pressure on a gas and as you increase pressure on a gas you squeeze molecules together and uh, give them less and less, less space until there comes a particular pressure at which the gas turns into a liquid similarly you can <coughs> um turn a liquid into a um well it will be um it will be a little complicated on this side but you can also turn a gas into a solid when you when you um you know the 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 on this line across this line you have evaporation and uh, con um, and of course uh, uh, boiling and evaporation and on this side you have condensation but condensation is a much broader word it can be used also for solidification um over here you have solid melting into a liquid and um, then on the other side you can have condensation or solidification and here gas going into solid is sublimation or the reverse of it okay so we have therefore various processes going on evaporation condensation melting and solidification and sublimation all of these processes are the ones that describe change of state so the change of state is described by um evaporation condensation um uh what is called um fusion no certain heat of uh, fusion okay and um, then you have uh, uh, solidification liquefaction liquefaction sublimation etc various names that go with these things all right uh the dirang so over here various um, points of transformations critical point so there are actually uh this water line this um, line liquid gas line goes and ends at a particular point over here it doesn't continue going forever it ends at a particular point and that particular point is called critical point it is critical point it is very important because beyond that point at pressures higher than this or temperatures higher than this there is absolutely no distinction between a gas and a liquid 
no distinction between a gas and a liquid. The system um, is in a state at, at beyond this point, at, at this, in this state, no distinction between a gas and a liquid. Okay. Critical point of uh, water. Let me write down critical points, some numbers for water or H2O. The critical points are 374 centigrade and 221 bars. 221 times as much atmospheric pressure as we have around us. Um, and of carbon, it is um, 31 degrees centigrade and 74 bar, much lower for carbon than for water. And uh, for nitrogen, Um, it is 126 degree centigrade, degree Kelvin actually, 126 Kelvin and 34 bar. <coughs> and also note that there is no critical point between liquid and solid phase and there is, a no, there is no critical point between solid and gas phase. So critical point is only over here. And then critical points also exist in other systems like magnetic and so on. But not in this particular case. Uh, not, not for liquid solid or gas solid phases. All right. Number one. Um, so the questions for us. Uh, in fact, I should, I should also be showing you a few other things, phase transitions of other systems. Um, I have, for example, the phase transition in a magnetic system. Uh, paramagnet, ferromagnet phase transition. So you have a system which is a magnet and you heat the system, give it sufficient heat, then individual atomic magnetic moments and be, be, before you give the heat, all the individual atomic magnetic moments are all aligned in the same direction. So in the case of ferromagnet, they are all aligned in the same direction. In the case of paramagnet, they are uh, randomly aligned, etc. So, what happens is take a ferromagnet, like an iron ferromagnet, and heat it up, then individual magnets will get this thermal energy and will start to um, fluctuate about their positions and slowly will lose all their orientation. And when they lose all their orientation, they become paramagnet. And then you take it in from that paramagnetic state and cool it down. Then there comes a particular point when their random motion is gone and they align themselves again in this manner. So a, <clears throat> a permanent magnet can be taken through these cycles of uh, going from a magnetized state into a demagnetized state. We had a little bit of, we, we mentioned it briefly when we talked of cooling uh, through demagnetization. Now, um, in this case, I can draw a phase diagram. Um, usually, the tendencies over here are the two opposite tendencies. Two opposite tendencies are uh, uh, 
temperature that create uh, creates disorder and uh, magnetic field that creates order. that aligns the individual magnetic moments. And this uh, magnetic field can be um, uh, external as well as internal. Internally interparticle interactions can give rise to internal magnetic fields which will align magnets, individual atomic magnets, to give a ferromagnet. So a ferromagnet can be of two kinds. One in which an external magnetic field aligns all the individual magnetic moments into one direction, which is actually what you do in the case of a, an electromagnet. You take a piece of iron and wind a coil around it, create a magnetic field and force all these randomly oriented magnetic moments into the direction of the field. This is what you do in the case of electromagnets. But there are other situations in which you have a system already existing at a given temperature in a magnetized state. And that state, magnetized state arises because of uh, interparticle interactions of a very specific kind though but interparticle interactions so iron can be found naturally in a magnetized state similarly many other uh, magnets can be found in nature and that is due to so this can be the magnetic field can be external as well as internal and therefore there are two opposite tendencies temperature that uh, that, that would like to create a situation of disorder uh, and magnetic field that orders them in one direction. All right? And that, therefore, the, the, the uh, phase diagram is in terms of this magnetic field and, and T. Remembering that this magnetic field, H, is... Uh, now you will remember that when I write H over here, I mean magnetic field for a magnetic system, not enthalpy, okay? I'm running short of alphabets. So this is, uh, um, for magnetic field, this, this phase diagram is actually um, something like this. All right. And in this diagram, the, 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 region outside the curve is paramagnet and inside the curve is ferromagnetic. So it says that if you do not apply any magnetic field and lower down the temperature there, there comes a particular point at which the system, atom, uh, system individual uh, molecular magnets will align themselves suddenly at one instant of uh, point this over here at one um, uh, temperature align themselves and then will become a ferromagnet along these lines but if you are over here and you have a magnetic moment and you increase the temperature no, sorry um, uh, or that you have uh, but as you increase the field, you also increase the magnetic moment and then you uh, have fuller magnetization over here. Now this is usually written as, uh, not as H and T phase, but as uh, uh, magnetization and um, uh, magnetization and temperature phase, not as H and T and magnetization at this particular point, magnetization starts to grow and then the magnetization grows up to a what is called 
saturation magnetization and uh, and at any time if you are wherever you are if you are in this particular phase at this time you can increase the temperature and cross over into a paramagnetic phase or you are over here and you increase um, um, so you can go over from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic phase this is uh, the, the the this is the phase diagram similarly a the an interesting phase diagram is that of um, a um, hm magnetic field magnetization phase diagram in the case of an antiferromagnet let me explain why antiferromagnets look interesting Antiferromagnets are interesting because antiferromagnets are where um, nearest neighbors are aligned anti-parallel to each other. Nearest neighbors are aligned anti-parallel to each other. And when this happens, this is this is actually something which is found in nature, antiferromagnet. The net magnetic moment of the substance is zero. But when you apply a magnetic field, you can turn this into a ferromagnet. And uh, I was going to show over here how an antiferromagnet turns into a ferromagnet, ferromagnet magnet. Through this diagram, where um, in the case of zero magnetic field, the mag total magnetization of this arrangement is zero. M is equal to zero. And when you start to apply magnetic field, suppose you apply magnetic field in this direction, uh, okay, in this direction, you apply magnetic field in this direction then that magnetic field cannot do very much to, cannot do anything to magnets, small atomic magnets already pointing in this direction. But what it can do is that it can start to rotate the ones which are uh, directed uh, in the other direction. And therefore, when there is a, there is a molecular magnet in this direction and you apply a strong magnetic field to it then it will start to rotate and then it will flip and it will become go in this direction okay this is easy to visualize and that factor actually comes in over here when you notice that this in magnetization because of this rotation it slowly increases uh, it was zero here because all the ups were were cancelling all the downs, and as the downs the down ones start to rotate, the up ones total magnetic moment starts to um, become more dominant, and it increases. And then uh, there comes a particular time when it suffers a very sudden jerk and doesn't actually goes from here to here in a big jump and that big jump will then takes it to a state like this and then it slowly reaches saturation magnetization this is the kind of phase transition which is very similar to the phase transition between the states of uh, the, between the uh, be in water between vapor and gaseous, vapor and uh, liquid phases. How do we see the uh, <laughs> the 
the how do we see the phase transitions taking place in water or in a liquid system going from liquid to gas or uh, solid to liquid this is usually seen in the form of uh, a pt phase diagram pressure temperature phase diagram in which you look at things in the form of isotherms and the isotherms actually look in the look like the following there would be you know the usual isotherm that we have we already are very familiar with and then slowly the isotherms start to change and they become something like this oh at pv i am sorry you are right you are right pv phase diagram sorry these are isotherms so these are isotherms and these isotherms show a discontinuous change like this a discontinuous change like this there is this discontinuous change and this discontinuous change is in a discontinuous change in volume suppose it was uh, water on it was liquid on this side and gas on the other side then um the water is uh, boils this is the boiling point but this is also the boiling point and this is also a boiling point and this is also a boiling point these are all the temperatures at which transitions take place this temperatures actually change at for different uh, uh, the 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 um the this is the boiling this is the critical pressure pc1 this is critical pressure pc2 pc3 and pc4 at temperatures let me call let me see now this is t1 and t2 and t3 and t4 and we are saying that actually if the system is at temperature t1 then water boils at temperature pc1 when temperature system is at uh, is at temperature t2 water boils at pressure pc2 when it is at temperature t3 water boils at temperature <coughs> pc p uh, c3 so um there is a p and t relationship now this is this time which is pressure and temperature relationship this is the relationship between uh, critical temperatures and critical pressures so let me put pc and tc over here critical temperatures and pressure and that usually is given by a line like this so that on this side is liquid on this side is gas or uh, vapors and that this ends over here at a critical point so uh as you increase the pressure you can increase the value of temperature at which the water boils right um by increasing pressure um one can increase the t 
temperature at which water boils. Okay, and um, uh, this is uh, what people normally use in uh, um, uh, thermal power plants where they put big things work under very high pressures so that <coughs> water remains water until uh, very high temperatures and then turns into steam at that temperature so that it is a superheated steam. <coughs> this is uh, the phase diagram. Now, what we need to study now, I'm now coming back to our agenda for in, in, the, in the topic on phases and phase transitions. What we need to now find uh, are the answers to the following question. What gives rise to um, different phases? Um, we need to also look at the physics of critical points. And lastly, uh, physics of uh, uh, phase boundaries. So what I will do is I will take up this, these points uh, when we meet again um, day after tomorrow. Uh, this, whatever I showed you here in, on these three, last three boards over here, the one, these two, and that one, is only to, I am not finished yet, please, uh, is only to give you a glimpse of uh, why the, these uh, phase transitions are interesting and what we, what we expect to see in the uh, topic of phase transitions and uh, what are the critical points that we need to study. So next time we will look at the stability of various systems and states and how that is related to phase transitions. Okay, thank you.